start. Tell her it's yep. only going to be Are you good. Twenty-five minutes. Five. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to go ahead and call our meeting to order. First item up on our agenda is to approve the agenda as presented. Does anybody have any additions or deletions for the agenda for tonight? Uh, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as presented. Absolutely. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Moving on, our first item is recognition of our guests from the Education Foundation, Mr. Scott Bacon. Yes, so Scott Bacon is our new um, Education Foundation president. He uh, spent a lot of time in his career in Knox County. He is known as the Coupon Book Man. He's kind of the creator of the coupon book in Knox County, and then he also has worked with us in Anderson County to get our coupon book up and running. But his kind of expertise is partners in education and really bridging that gap between school systems and, and uh, businesses and local community members. And he, he has been an excellent addition to the Education Foundation. And so we invited him just to kind of come and tell you uh, this organization has undergone quite a bit of changes and a, a renewed area of focus and so um, I invited him to kind of come and tell you the good things that are happening with the Ed Foundation. So welcome Scott. Thank you Kelly. I'm gonna take you with me on the road. That was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Suzanne's back there going, who's she talking about? I don't recognize that. Thank you all for letting me have just a minute. I, I'm here tonight to do something that probably ought to happen at least annually and I don't know if it ever has in terms of someone from the representing the Education Foundation came to just kind of update you on what we're doing, how we're doing it, and, and kind of what the focus areas are, and, and, and update you on the dollars that have come to Clinton City Schools during this school year. Um, as Kelly mentioned, the, the Education Foundation has undergone some changes as we've added a few folks to the, the roles to expand, you know, the network of contacts we have out in the community, and it's been a very good thing to add these folks that um, do have a lot of contacts and are helping us open some doors and do some different things uh, and think bigger about what the role the Education Foundation can have for, for your three schools. Um, we're basically focusing on four or five areas, one being the list doesn't particularly impact you all, but it, your kids that go through ultimately will get, be in this position. Uh, the early post-secondary opportunities for high school students who are either in dual enrollment classes or um, middle college classes that they may be in at Rhone State and just because of the one the system being the way it is you can only take so much of that scholarship dollars that the state provides and if you exceed that then you're paying on your own and, and some of these kids who have um, some difficult financial situations occasionally will hear of a need and, and try to step in there and fill that and those are limited but they do happen occasionally um, you all know and heard about the teacher supply depot and that's something that uh, is in our just finished up our third year this year um, and continues to this year we had 250 teacher visits combined between Clinton City and Anderson County Schools and uh, that continues to grow and, and more and more teachers come and taking advantage of that and taking free items back to their, their classrooms uh, we're doing instructional grants and also health and wellness grants and health and wellness grants are related to the 5k that happens in October around here every year and so I'll share with you in just a minute what, what that looks like for Clinton City uh, and then occasionally there will be a grant opportunity and we act as the fiscal agent for either or both school districts and that was the case with a grant that came from Y-12 Federal Credit Union for some books that um, went into, the, I guess, I don't know, all three got access to those or how you all split those up, but um, about $3,000 worth of, do of uh, funding total, uh, excuse me, 582 for you guys, 3,500 total between the two school districts. So let me just quickly run through what, what this has looked like school year to date for Clinton City Schools. Um, teacher Supply Depot, you all have about 15% of the teachers that come through on any given opening. We've done this for three years and it looks about the same um, every opening we have. And so just taking that and extrapolate that and across what the value is for the year, uh, $2,439.73. And I've got this that I'll leave with Kim and she can get to you so you don't have to worry about writing anything down. Um, instructional grants, uh, 1900 thus far. The way we're doing instructional grants is it's a rolling process. So literally someone could turn one in tomorrow and we would consider it uh, probably at the April um, foundation meeting. The health and wellness grants that I referred to earlier, 
$3,856, that was six grants that went to your various, uh, one system-wide and all three schools were involved in, in the others. And then the book purchase through the Y-12 Foundation was $582.39. The total year to date is $8,778.12 in terms of the impact that's had uh, in Clinton City Schools. And we've got one more grant that's coming up next Thursday that the committee has approved it, so I'm sure the full board will for $400. So that's going to put us a little over $9,000 impact to Clinton City this school year. And it will, again, continue to grow as uh, some of your teachers apply for grants and we're able to fund some of those throughout the rest of the school year as they prep for, for next school year. Um, again, I've got this information. I'll leave with Kim and can, can get that to you. Um, we do have an event that, that, that's listed at the bottom of your agenda that's coming up obviously the annual teacher of the year event which is always a, a, a nice event for us to be able to honor some of the top educators uh, across the two school districts here and to honor the principals that are doing such a great job annually and supervisors and, and whatnot um, it'll be the, the uh, 21st of April at 5 30 over at First Baptist Church is our traditional setting and I hope that you all will, will plan to be there that night and, and take it in and be a part of that evening and again help us honor the teachers that are doing such a great job. Do you want to talk uh, a little bit about the changes that we're making to that program to streamline that night a little bit? Well let me just say there won't be videos. <laughs> no no cheering I thought that might bring them. Um, we're not doing on the inside. They're no, there you go they're all yeah they're, right they, they're trying to be politically correct here. Uh, we are trying to, to streamline the event a little bit and, and um, though I enjoyed seeing the various stories on the on the teachers and, and it, it was an opportunity to, to do that uh, it made for a pretty long evening when you multiply three minute videos times 20 um, the best you can do that's an hour so um, what we're looking at is just to literally do more of a recognition where it's it's strictly Kelly talking about the the winners from Clinton City and Dr. Parrott doing the same thing from Anderson County and shortening that where we can uh, recognize them still without uh, lengthening the night too much and burdening folks after a long day. So we're looking forward to that and see how those changes are, are enacted. We're also doing a little something different this year in that we're actually looking for corporate sponsors to sponsor individual school tables to personalize it a little bit for those corporate sponsors who wish to be a part of that. Uh, we've got a good start on making that happen so that we can have a, a corporate sponsor for each school within the two school districts. And it's uh, a little bit something different this year as well. And so we've got a, a good group of 20 plus that are out there shaking the trees and see if we can come out with, with that. So uh, I just appreciate the opportunity and willingness that this school district gives us as community members to rally around your three schools. And um, you know, we've got a great community here, but if you don't ask them, they're not going to walk up and hand you money. And so our job is to work with Kelly and Dr. Parrott and find out what, what initiatives are out there that we need to be pressing uh, and making uh, priorities for this community. And so thank you all for allowing us to be a part of your work that's very important to the future of this community. Anything else, Kelly, that we no, need thank to Thank you. Any questions to for cover? Scott? Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you, you all. Thank you. Again, I'll leave, this, I'll leave this with Kim and she can get the copies to you. He's doing, a, he's doing a great job. Uh, just so that you know, our three Clinton City tables have already been sponsored. So um, all occasions, party rentals and Clinton Drugstore combined, and they're going to sponsor Clinton Elementary's uh, table. Uh, Bear Stevenson is going to um, sponsor South Clinton, of course, because he loves the bears. And then uh, Ron Honeycutt, Monica's sweet father, is going to sponsor uh, North Clinton's table and then we have also purchased a table on behalf of Clinton City School Board and Clinton City Schools or uh, Clinton City Council and so um, now we're working to get all the Anderson County Schools taken care of and there's no doubt that we'll be able to do that hopefully before before April the 21st yeah <laughs> there you go there you go I'll commit him I commit him you tell him I said that <laughs> thank you Scott thank you so much all right moving on uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve our consent agenda. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to our financial report for February with Mr. Ray. Everybody should have in their uh, the packets the uh, February 29th financial reports. Um, 
Again, nothing really exciting to report except our sales tax revenue has been um, really growing. However, <laughs> um, with the state of affairs, sales tax might start to decline a little bit again. Um, but we'll get into that when I go over the budget amendment a little bit. Um, our collections are as expected for the year. Um, any questions uh, that you would have on the general purpose school fund? And then the federal projects is uh, grant based. Uh, we spend, we have a grant allocation. We spend X amount of dollars. We apply for a reimbursement of the same amount and we get the reimbursement. So we're uh, usually about 30 to 45 days in arrears on collections and that's uh, above average. Um, cafeteria fund, uh, we're looking at a, a slight surplus of $30,000 thus far at February 29th this year. So uh, we're still in the same direction, same path, um, which leads me to believe that uh, the pricing and things that we've approved is, is probably in line where, we're, where it should be. So if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Any questions for Mr. Ray? All right, hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve the February financial report as presented. So we have a motion, do we have a second? Second. Any further questions, comments, or discussion? <clears throat> hearing none, Kim, could you do a roll call vote, please? David Cleaner. Yes. Tim Bible. Yes. Merle Price. Yes. Joey Smith. Yes. Curtis Isbell. Yes. Motion carries. Moving on to uh, budget amendment number three. Should have a memo from, from me about uh, the, the highlights of the budget amendment. What I try to do is you've got three pages of kind of ins and outs, increases and decreases. So my memo, uh, the bulleted items, I try to uh, comment about anything over $20,000. Um, so. Uh, we have increases in revenues, that first portion uh, of the memo, those three bulleted items. First bullet's property tax and sales tax increase of $250,000. Um, that's split pretty much evenly between sales tax and property tax. I think sales tax, the growth, we will see an overall net increase compared to prior year, but I think our growth will slow down um, as a result of the current events. Um, but that, you know, we only have a few more months left in the fiscal year, so I think if we see a real impact from that, if it's sustained, it'll be more in next year's budget. I don't, I'm not really too concerned about this year's budget and sales tax. Um, I think we'll experience some growth in our enrollment, so that should help offset some of the decreases as well. Uh, BP membership growth. We are gonna receive $68,000 in total. That's been confirmed from the State Department. We've already received half. 34,000 and the other 34 will come at the end of the year. Um, city general fund transfer. The city transfers this money. It's, it's not called revenue, it's called the transfer in, and that's a million dollars, and that's the loan for the addition. Um, and then the $60,000 uh, is for the Chromebooks. Uh, this year we are receiving the money from the city and we are purchasing the Chromebooks. And so those, those budgeted revenues kind of bring us to, to actual what, what our history is, is showing us uh, and what the future may entail. Recommended budget amendment uh, expenditures, um, I'll just go down the list and, and if you have a question, please stop me. 73,500 increase in special ed aids, clerical error from emissions of sales and salaries and benefits, well, that was my fault. Um, I omitted that from the original budget so that's on me. Um, $18,000 increase in guidance salary paid for leave. And I'm including that because it's my wife. I just don't want anybody to think I'm hiding anything. Um, but she had enough sick days where she needed to get paid out like we do for any other staff member. We're not treating her any different than anybody else. Um, but that did result uh, in an increase in that line items expenditures because we had to pay Ms. Price, who's the current guidance counselor that replaced my wife. Any questions on that? Um, $55,000 increase in support services, salary and benefit allocation. Um, and that's just due to some movement we've had in some positions. 
a 60,000 increase in regular ed equipment for Chromebooks. That relates to the revenue increase above. $65,000 increased safe schools equipment for the crisis alert system that you all had approved uh, for the three schools. And then the $1.1 million increase, a net increase in the seed at S addition capital project. I anticipate at June 30th, we're gonna be between 80 and 90% complete. So part of that expenditure will actually fall into July and August when we pay the final bills and fall into next fiscal year. So I'm trying to budget what, what I anticipate spending. Um, that'll probably be revised in our last meeting and last budget amendment. Um, and a $40,000 decrease in transfer to the city for a loan payment. Um, don't get excited, we're not really saving $40,000 over the long term, it's just we're not paying interest now and principal now for the loan that was already paid off, the million dollar loan, those principal and interest payments will start hitting in next fiscal year. Um, so that's just the time, it's a timing issue. Um, we're deferring uh, an expenditure for that. And uh, the recommended budget amendment in federal projects is simply uh, reclassifying $700 in expenditures from travel to staff development, uh, pretty standard, and nothing recommended for cafeteria fund. Any questions? Any questions for Mr. Ray regarding budget amendment number three? Looks pretty straightforward and routine. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve budget amendment number three as presented. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions, comments for Mr. Ray? Hearing none, Kim, could we have a roll call vote, please? David Quainer? Yes. Tim Bible? Yes. Merle Price? Yes. Joey Smith? Yes. Curtis Isbell? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Ray. Thank you. Uh, moving on. Uh, we'll go to new business requiring action by the board. First item up is our 2020 and 2021 calendar school year for next year. Yes, you all have previously approved the mm -hmm. uh, calendar for uh, next year, but we wanted to make a slight revision based on something that happened this year. And actually, Lori Collins was the one who brought this to my attention, and I thought it was a fabulous idea. But when you look at, you know, we try to do the collaborative days once a month. <laughs> And when you look at the months of January and February, that's usually when we are closed due to inclement weather or the flu hits us, but we usually end up using some of our stockpile days during those, during that time. And so what typically happens then, and it happened this year, we were closed for flooding for a couple of days, and then we had an in-service day on the 12th, and then President's Day on that, on, 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 we had an in-service day on a Friday, and then President's Day closed on a Monday. And you've already, it's, you just can't settle into a routine because we've canceled school due to inclement weather, then we canceled the flu, then it was the flood, and then now we're doing a collaborative day, and now we're doing President's Day. And it's just really, really hard for the kids and parents to settle into a routine. And so what we had in the original calendar was we were doing a collaborative day in February, but we were not doing a collaborative day in March. And so what we did was we just flip-flopped those two days. And so we've taken the collaborative day out of, Mar of February and we have put it to March the 12th, which bumps up to spring break. And we did that just in anticipation that we already missed so many days in January and February due to other things we thought that might provide a little bit more consistency um, in the number of instructional days that we got during that time. So um, it doesn't really affect anything else. Start dates, end dates, breaks, and everything are the same. It was just flip-flopping those two collaborative days, but because it did, it was a change, it did, does require your all's approval on that. Any questions? That's nice to get that Friday. Yeah, yeah. People usually go anyway. Right. Yeah. Yes. There's not a whole lot accomplished <laughs> on that. Yeah. No. All right. Any further questions or comments for Kelly regarding our uh, our revised calendar for the 2020-2021 school year? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to present the calendar as presented. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to school board policies and Appendix E. So two, two, one new policy and one revised policy in front of you tonight for approval. TSBA, part of what we pay them to do is they do an audit of all of our policies each year. 
to make sure that we are fully aligned with all the new Tennessee code annotators and that we have all the required policies. And uh, the threat assessment team is a new policy. That was a state law that went into effect where each school system is required to have a threat assessment team and some procedures in place for how to deal with when we feel that there has been a threat um, made by a student or a student has become a danger, danger to be in class. And so uh, that one is a new policy. Um, and then the field trip um, and excursions is just a revised. There's just some updated language in there, but nothing significantly changes there. Okay. Any questions or comments regarding our new school board policies and revised policies in Appendix E? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve on first and second reading. Uh, our new and revised school board policies in Appendix E. So moved. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? <laughs> motion carries. Moving on. Uh, we'll be moving ahead with our contractor for our new addition. I'm going to defer to Scott Ray on this one. Uh, we did have three people who answered our bid. Scott and the architect um, met with all three of them this afternoon and received the bids, and so I'll let him fill you in on how that played out. Yes, we'll just begin with the end and then work our way to the beginning there. And uh, Arts and Construction was the lowest bid. Um, it came in at $1,392,500. Um, there were seven alternates and that's quite a bit what that means is we can accept or reject an alternate the base bid was one million three hundred and sixty three dollars <throat> so the base bid was uh, the meat and potatoes is 1.36 and we wound up at 1.39 the difference mostly was um, we had an alternate one and two, which is a preventative maintenance plan for the HVA systems, the mechanical systems. And we were starting to do that in the past four or five years. We've been doing that with bids, and it's really worked in our favor. Um, keeps uh, the equipment that was installed properly installed because they know it's their baby for the next four years. And it comes with an auto renew portion, no more than a 5% increase, so we can keep that going if, if, if we felt like it was in our favor. Um, so that was $19,000 for alternate one and two, that's year one and then years uh, two, three, and four. Um, alternate three was a moisture barrier, uh, and that was actually a deduction. They saved us 10000 Alternate four was the cabinets uh, um, that would be installed like we have on the west that kind of match the classroom cabinets that we have in the west end. Um, Generally, that's a very pricey item, so I add, I asked it that it be an alternate so I could price it out myself if, um, so for example, one contractor priced the cabinets at $43,000, and the winning contractor priced the same cabinets, because the detailed drawings, it's not just what you want to put in as a contractor, it's very specific, and the, the winning bid came in at, for cabinets, 18500 Wow. So for that price of $18,500, I can't beat it. I can't <clears throat> do better on my own, so I've accepted that price as an alternate increase uh, from the base bid. Uh, I even priced out builder's risk insurance on our own um, and made that an alternate. Again, they came in very close to what I got quoted, so I'm just going with what they have. Uh, uh, there was an alternate for uh, uh, the parking lot, um, and it, we anticipated that alternate be a deduction from the base bid, and the reason being we were going to give them, shut down the back of the school completely, except for the area around the cafeteria, which is pretty much a one-way out of the school, the back of the school. So that would be the only entrance and exit, and we were thinking that the contractors would give us a high value to that, so a large deduction. Well, it was only a $6,000 deduction. So we, my um, recommendation is that we not accept that deduction um, 
keep the back parking lot, keep the flow of traffic for dismissal and pickup in the back as it is now. The route may change, but the flow will be the same. I think there's somebody in Jenna's here that might be happy. Jenna's cheering back there. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, as a board, you can always choose to accept that alternate and we close it down, but um, my recommendation, just kidding, is not to do that. Um, so the worst case scenario would be probably two weeks that no teachers can park on the lower section. So the upper section would still remain for teacher parking. The flow of traffic in and out would remain the same. They would lose that parking, and I think it's 24, 25 spots the week after spring break. One week is best case scenario, but I'm planning on two weeks. So basically on a Friday, they're gonna be done with one phase, open up the move, the, the entrance that's moving up Marshall Street by 30 feet, and on Monday, parents will just have a different route and we'll be out there. I'll be out there directing traffic. Um, shouldn't be a disruption. Um, so that's what got us from the base bid of 1.36 million to the approved bid of 1.392 million. The budget for the job from the architects at the beginning of this, which started, I believe, well, this is dated September of 2019, for construction was 1.395 million and we are at 1.392 million. So we are $3,000 wow. less than budget. I mean, they were pretty on target with their budget. Now. I love it when an architect gives an accurate. Accurate number. <laughs> they were, that, that is so helpful. <laughs> um, there's uh, that 1.329 million includes $50,000 in contingency, so that's built in. The only, generally, the only contingency you're, we're gonna have on this job and most jobs of this nature would be in the site prep, which is your foundation work. When they excavate that playground, they may have to dig down more and remove more dirt and bring in clean fill or rock, um, or they may not. But we have 50,000 built into that. So best case scenario is they don't run into any issues. So that 1.392 million job now becomes 1.34. So we save 50 grand. It's already built in. That would be a change order deduction for us. So um, other than that, um, I, I guess my recommendation is one, we accept um, you allow us to enter into a contract with Hearts and Construction. The only thing that's unknown at this time, and I'm working on it, is the subcontractor for the mechanical, which is your HVAC. Without saying any names, um, I, we have some prior experience with the subcontractor that the general contractor is using. I'm asking the, and the general contractor has agreed, he's gonna send me a list of everybody who sent him an estimate. So the way it works is the general contractor will just send a request to all the subs that he wants to work with, or sometimes the subs will even just send him a quote or bid, and then he'll put that into his uh, base bid, and that's what, that's what he comes up with. That's what makes up the 1.363 million so the, uh, if, if we change mechanical and uh, contractors, um, it could increase the cost a little bit, could decrease the cost a little. I think I can, we can get it cheaper um, by using a different mechanical contractor. So That's basically, it. basically I'll, I'll, I'll just say it. Yeah. It's the contractor that we have used for South Clinton Elementary School where we've experienced a very Lots of trouble. Lots of trouble. And so um, we don't want to have a repeat of that. And so we'll just look at the other people who bid, and then we, we will choose another based on that. And it may have a little bit of a slight difference on the, the pricing. But I think just on past experience, we're already replacing units there 
and we should not be replacing units there. They're only, what, five, six years old? That was the job so, that started us down the path of the extended warranty program. <laughs> yeah. So we just, we just want to make good decisions, and if we have a negative experience with a vendor, we don't want to enter back into that again. And so I appreciate him for having the foresight of picking up on that and addressing it before we approve a contract. But the architect looked up some state laws for us today, and we would have the authority to work with the contractor to, do an, uh, to pick an additional subcontractor for that. The general contractor didn't express concern to me, but until I get the numbers, uh, if that doesn't work, and we do use the uh, subcontractor that's part of this, this base bid, um, then my proposal will be to, um, to utilize the mechanical engineer that has been working with us for several years. Um, um, he's designed the auditorium. He's designed work at North Clinton for us. He did not work at South Clinton. Um, is to hire him to do the inspections and to make sure that things are going right technically for the HVAC equipment. Um, I think that would be money worth it if, um, now remember, we're going to also hold them accountable to a four-year contract. Of, if it breaks, they're fixing it. Parts, labor, everything. We do not have an HVAC cost filters, nothing for four years. So. That will protect us, no matter who we use. Um, so uh, on that part, and then there's a, we'll enter into a geotechnical contract um, for $7,190, and that's on us, in addition to the general contractor. They are the ones that will come and inspect the, uh, the excavation. They'll certify that a fill is required or not required. They'll inspect the concrete before it's poured, the rebar that's that's installed in the concrete, any welding that's been done. And basically that is your foundation. If your foundation is right, pretty much everything else will fall into place for the most part. Um, you're also required to have them certify several things. So you, you need to pay for the engineering stamp, but that's a service we will pay for on our side um, to do that. Um, any questions? I feel like I've dropped a lot of information on you all. Have you um, gotten wrecks on this contractor, the general contractor? I did not know the name. So we, uh, there was a young architect there who knew technology, and I called it Facebook stalking. But I, she looked them up on the Internet. Um, then we discovered that they actually do some work for ORNL. Um, and there's a division of our... Uh, architect firm that works with them. So these two architects weren't familiar with them because a separate division within their firm actually works with them. So we made, they made a few phone calls. Um, we don't have, I, I can't say that we have somebody that said, oh yeah, they're the best, but I don't have any information that says, there's nothing that gives me pause. I don't have any information to, to think otherwise. Um, um, I guess there were three contractors who bid at Jenkins and Style, and they were at, uh, this is important information. Their base bid, I'll just give you the base bids, 1.4 million, actually 1.459,000. 1, K and F construction, and that is um, the contractor that worked on South Clinton. Um, they came in at 1,370,000. And then the Hearts and Construction came in at 1,363,000. I like those, the spread on that because there's not anybody that's really high and anybody that's really low. That often scares me because um, you feel like maybe you missed something. Um, but since all three contractors, for the most part, their base bids were, were fairly close, I think we have a good, um, good bid process and good uh, response from these contractors. Um, do you all have any other questions for me? Where are they uh, out of? Because they're, they're not local, are they? They are out of Knoxville. I think uh, they have several partners that own the company. One of them is a lawyer in, in, off of Gay Street in Knoxville. Um, 
and then their their construction business I think is located off of um, Hardin Valley in West Knoxville and I think they have uh, a subcontractor that actually does mechanical but they don't like to on a project that they're bidding they don't necessarily like to pull in their mechanical division they think it might be a conflict of interest but um, and they're in Oak Ridge who is the gentleman that you were talking to on the phone uh, Chris Hare okay um, it was a tight uh, response. The bids were due at 3.30. They all came in. One bid came in at uh, 3.15, and the other bids came in at uh, 3.25 and 3.28. You weren't sweating, were you? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I was concerned. Uh, I Kate, did get a text from him at one point in time, and he's like, only one person's here. <laughs> It's kind of embarrassing, um, but I really think we have a good, a good. There's no reason that you know we can always say we don't want to do it. As a board, we can say no, nope, we'll pass. There's no reason that that we should do that and rebid it. I don't see a reason at this point that we need to do that. Um, and there's nothing significant that other than the HVAC that I'm still working on, but I don't think that's monetarily significant at this point and so after the contract is approved they are scheduled to begin when so uh, we're gonna allow them to start mobilizing on March 20th which is that Friday before spring break so um, pretty quick turnaround so you will notice uh, work will begin um, and then hopefully over spring break they'll have the majority of the parking or the drive work done. And you know, concrete takes you know, five days to cure before you can dry on, drive on it anyway. So you're, you're definitely looking at at least one week after spring break where uh, teachers aren't gonna be able to park in the lower section. You still have the drive for the parents to, to drop off and for flow. But, um, I think Kelly indicated you, you know, we have options that we're gonna work on. Time frame of the project? Uh, well, the the contract or the the bid documents state that the the job will be done by July seventeenth. And he said that with a chuckle. I mean, weather depending. Yeah, you just don't know. Then we give them. There's a certain amount of days, you know, that we provide for weather, and we, we you know. Um, natural events happen um, so I would be happy with you know August 1st after a certain date and I think it's uh, if you take out the weather dates there's a $500 a day deduction and then that turns into I think after 15 days it turns into a thousand dollars a day deduction for every day after so we did build in um, some damages there for us um, Obviously, I guess our intention is we're going to be hiring staff, and the expectation is that can start working. If they don't really have a space to work. It's, it's, we're kind of paying them to, to not work, and so that contract needs to kind of cover that. That's, I didn't want to make it so high that it scared people away, though. You can do that, and then no contractor will want to touch it. Um, but, yeah, I'd be happy with August 1st. Further questions for Mr. Ray? Scott, I just want to applaud you on the, mm. on the yes, amount of detail work. and oh. <laughs> the, the amount of information that you've, you've been able to gather and everything else. You, you do a phenomenal job. Oh, thank I you. I just want to, to point that out, that it does not go unnoticed, all no. your hard work <laughs> no. and sweat that you put into it. Um, you know, it is, uh, this is our first construction project in a long time so uh, you know hopefully it'll go better than South Point uh, well hopefully so hopefully mm. so but um, you know we're always nervous as we go into yeah. into this so but I think I think you've got your bases covered I think uh, I think it's a great recommendation um, you know I, I fully think that uh, moving forward with the time frames that you've got I think uh, I think it's gonna work well you've done a great job thank you yes. What are you going to call this? Is it the West West Wing? 
<laughs> I've really been thinking West about Wing that. Squared. I just wondered. Well, I'm smelling a fundraiser. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we could do a fundraiser to name it's the the Blaze Wing. <laughs> We're naming Blaze everything else. We'll I'm sure E.T. Sammy will hear this and, and probably have it named um, <laughs> with a check. So I like the way you think, though. Yeah. I'm not sure if you all are aware of this, but Scott wears many hats in his former. So the fact that we've been able to land an accountant who has taught school before, but he is also, he has a contractor license. And so when it comes to things like this, he just is able to bring such a, well-rounded perspective of all areas and so he's done a great job right there's there's Thank you. always with scott in the room there's very few if any surprises ever <laughs> sarah well, may disagree we'll with decide. you we'll decide that in, in, in about six or eight months yeah. but up till this point, pressure's on buddy i feel like i'm being set up maybe you're good right now buddy. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no All pressure, right. Scott. No pressure. All right. Any further questions or comments for Mr. Ray or, or Kelly uh, regarding our contractor <laughs> and or process, times, dates, or revenues, or anything? Sounds good. All right. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve uh, Hartson uh, as our contractor for Clinton Elementary School. Project that is correct, right? Mm -hmm. correct. So moved. All right, we have a motion. Second. A second. We have a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? All right, Kim, could we have a roll call vote, please? David Planner. Yes. Kim Bible. Yes. Merle Cross. Yes. Joey Smith. Yes. Curtis Isbell. Yes. Motion carries. Moving on, we'll move into reports and information. Okay, we'll start with North Clinton, Miss Ryle. Since you're up front, we'll let you come first. So we ended the month of February with a fantastic read day event. We had over 70 visitors uh, who came to read. We had lots of people who supported us that day. Ridge Church provided gift bags uh, with gift cards and other kinds of goodies in there to thank readers for coming. Faith Promise Church uh, provided the use of their hashtag camera that visitors, staff, and students could take pictures that when they were posted to social media, then with uh, the hashtag NCES Read Day, it would print a photo with our school logo on it. Uh, we had many athletes, cheerleaders from Clinton High School who came to read and provided uh, their dragon mascots, which the kids really liked. Uh, Anna, Elsa, and Olaf were also there to pose with students for pictures. Everybody got a big kick out of it. It was a, it was a grand day. Um, March 5th, um, North Clinton and South Clinton Elementary had students who practiced at um, the South Clinton Park for Special Olympics. Um, Emily DeVoe is a WBIR um, reporter and she has done several different things with our school. She would have done a, a segment, but she was not able to and so she contacted Emily Stroud, who's also from WBIR, to come and do a segment which promoted the students and their upcoming pancake breakfast at the Apple Blossom Cafe, which is this Saturday from 8 to 10, uh, $5 a ticket. Feel free to come and enjoy some uh, sausage and pancakes. And our um, CDC students have been practicing. I actually got to buy a fake ticket and sit down and eat some fake sausage and pancakes the other day uh, while the students were practicing serving. It was really sweet. So they're very excited. Um, at the same time, uh, when that segment was aired, Volunteer Case and Container, um, uh, his, Danny Worley has contacted NCES and said they wanted to make sure that the Blaze Special Olympians have what they need to participate in the Special Olympics. And so um, he is going to make sure that any needs that are taken care of or not taken care of by the pancake breakfast are taken care of for our students. We had our, today we had our community pre-K um, advisory council. Um, was held. We had uh, voluntary pre-K teachers, staff, school officials, parents, community members came to show that we're continuing to meet the needs of the highly qualified pre-K program. Uh, tomorrow we have a lot of stuff going on. We had Dollywood players will be coming 
and performing a piece of children's literature about a character named Molly Lou Mellon for uh, kindergarten through third grade. And then we have some visitors uh, that are World War II experts, and they call themselves the 501st, and they will follow up after the Dollywood players for the fifth and sixth grade students since they do, um, World War, both groups do um, things on uh, World War II. Um, they will present information for those students about women in the military, special services, and paratroopers during World War II. So that'll be really exciting. The students are excited about that. We have Spring Picture Day on the 17th by Legends Photography, and the 19th we're kind of doing a little trial run of something called Come to Class Night, where families and students will have classes in three 15-minute little segments, and they can do a second grade class, a fifth grade class, maybe a special area class, uh, and do a little uh, short little mini lesson um, from four to five. Uh, we're gonna see how that goes, and we may make it a little bit bigger, but I think we have families who don't necessarily understand all the things that are entailing you know, the educational process, especially in the primary grades. So this will give them a little test uh, or a little taste of, uh, or test, uh, <laughs> either one, <laughs> of um, what school is like now, what some of the expectations are and what lessons are, are like. It's very different from what they probably remember themselves. And on the 30th, we will have a, our monthly PTCC meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Thank Green. you. Huh? Did she get it? She, I don't know if she's gotten it yet or not. Huh? You see this, North Clinton's. I did. I'm so excited about that. Yes, our, that was the hashtag pictures. Our hashtag camera pictures, several of those were in there. Um, we had a lot. It was, it, was, it was one of our bigger event days that we've had since I've been in North Clinton. It was good. All right, Miss Sharp. We're so glad you're back with us this month. You look wonderful. I'm so glad to be back. I don't ever want to be home for that long again <laughs> on medical leave, so I don't ever want to leave school either, so I'm glad to be back. Um, it's been a busy month for us as well. Um, our PLC meetings are uh, focusing on the teachers' TN Ready prep plans, um, so we've been talking through what the students will be doing. Our second grade is testing this year, so that's been um, an interesting journey with them, trying to help them prepare. Um, in our data meetings, we'll be looking at projection reports from TVOS for last year, and what that does is it shows um, the chance of proficiency um, of the students this year. So we're going to be looking at those and taking that into consideration, too, when we're uh, preparing for T and Ready. Um, we're also looking at iReady usage and pass rates. Um, we have an iReady incentive. It's a Candyland theme, and the students have to pass so many levels. Um, based on their grade, and um, they get prizes and different incentives. We had a board, and it got so full, they had little pieces. We had to make the pieces a little bit smaller, but um, our, since then, we began our incentive, our pass rates, um, and our time on task has increased. So that's been really good for all students. Um, our student leadership right now is raising money uh, for Children's Hospital. Um, we hope to give them a nice donation and the class that raises the most money gets a pizza party so it's a win-win for everybody um our coordinated school health we're also collecting pennies for putnam county um, so an effort to help the uh, people that um, had to go through the tornado um, help them a little bit um, congratulations to sharon hunt she was our teacher of the year and she is clinton city schools teacher of the year as well we are so proud of Sharon. Um, she teaches special ed at Clinton Elementary School, and she is everywhere. She has a piece in everybody's education. We're just so proud of her. Um, on Thursday, the 13th of February, we had empty bowls from 4.30 to 6.30, and Clinton Elementary raised around $4,500. So we were um, super proud of our students and teachers and thankful for those who came um, to that event that night. Also, on the 28th of February, uh, we had our assembly at 815, and we also had our read day. Um, the students had a wonderful time. We had um, a little celebration at the assembly um, where we did a few cheers and things, and we would also like to thank the Courier um, for recognizing Stephanie Brock during Literacy Week as a champion of literacy. Um, on March 10th, which was just a few days ago, we had our monthly leadership team and we discussed incentives 
for TN Ready Prep and effort, and we also discussed um, the traffic, um, which hopefully now may change a little bit, so I can meet back with, back with them. They'll be excited, though. Uh, today we had our PTCC meeting, and um, our incentive committee came. Um, we discussed the upcoming construction again. Um, on the 17th, we will have federal monitoring in the morning, so they will come and discuss how we notify parents and keep up with our Title I um, documents and notifications. On the 19th, we have spring pictures. We also have parent conferences that night from three to six, and then um, the next week will be spring break, which we're looking forward to. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ms. Sharp. And Ms. Bonesteel. So March has already been a super fun month. Um, we had our annual STEAM night on March 5th. So STEAM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Art, and Mathematics. Um, we kicked off the day by having a representative from TWRA come out and he met with each grade level during the school day and talked about um, some of the local wildlife and he brought some fish and some salamanders and some different things for the kids to learn about. And so that was a great way to kind of kick off our STEAM night that evening. Um, ORAU came out and did a great job. They always partner with us for STEAM, STEAM night and they bring amazing activities. The kids love it. Um, I think the most popular one is um, the foam gnomes. So they get to do, and um, they make a chemical reaction. And it makes this big colored foam object that they can take home. So they're all walking around with their foam gnomes. Um, but it was a super fun night. And Lori Irwin, um, first grade teacher at South Clinton, is in charge of planning that. And so she did a great job. But we really appreciate ORAU partnering with us again. March 6th was our annual read day. And I think it's one of the best days at South Clinton Elementary. Um, we had lots and lots of guest readers, and KK's not here, but she came to read to some of our classes, so I wanted to tell her thank you. Um, all the kids and staff members dressed up in different costumes, and we had a costume contest, and our mascot bear made an appearance. And the kids, especially the older ones, are having a really fun time trying to figure out who is the bear. <laughs> So they're trying so to get a real bear, not Bear Stevenson. Right. Like it's a, real, a, it's real a real, mascot. it's a black bear mascot. Yeah. So um, he was walking around the hallways and um, he was one of the guest judges in the costume contest and the kids were looking around. I could see the older ones trying to figure out what teachers were in the gym and who was maybe missing. So they haven't figured it out yet. Um, on March 10th, the Dollywood players came and performed for kindergarten, first and second and third grade. And they performed Stand um, Tall, Molly Lou Mellon, and they did a great job, and we appreciate them offering that to us every year. Coming up on March 19th, um, South Clinton is hosting the Clinton City Schools Grand Families Night. So we're really excited about that because we have a lot of um, grandparents and other family members at South Clinton that are raising children, and so it's a good opportunity for them to um, talk to some people and get some good resources. We still have a lot of fun after school activities going on. We're doing third and fourth grade math groups every week. Blaze Reader Society is still happening. Um, Art Club is taking place for um, first, second, and third grade. Orph Ensemble is still going strong. Um, fifth and sixth grade band, the Steam Bridge Club. And I do want to say congratulations to Lindsay Dungan. She was recognized as our champion of literacy during Literacy Week by the Clinton Courier. So we're really proud of her, but I think her kids were even more excited about her receiving that award. They were so excited to watch her get that and to take a picture and for her to wear her T-shirt that she got. So um, congratulations to her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bumsteel. That concludes our principal reports. All right. Uh, please make note of the uh, teacher's banquet that's coming up and also the support staff banquet that's coming up. Um, next meeting will be here. Um, sixth grade graduation is May the 21st. And so uh, we'll move on to the director's report. Isn't that crazy that we're announcing sixth grade graduation? That just, this year has flown by. I've got quite a few updates. Some of them had already been said, so I'll try to go quickly. I know this has been one of our longer one of our longer meetings, but I want to keep you update uh, up to date on a few things. The first bullet we're going to pretend doesn't exist. So earlier today, we um, 
Scott and I and Jenna and Jenna's met with our leadership team and we've really worked hard because we thought that we were going to have to um, close the back totally due to traffic and we were going to have to move all the traffic to the front of the school for arrival and dismissal. Uh, but we were pleasantly surprised when the bids came in today. So by 4.30 this afternoon, that plan had been reversed and we feel like that we can still continue to drop off, do student drop off in the back. So we're just going to ignore bullet number one. Um, uh, we will be communicating with parents before spring break just that their the construction will begin and kind of prepare them um, what the back is going to look like and how it will eventually be moved over but we um, that was the best news that I've heard in a really long time that we were not going to have to shut shut the back altogether um, I want to spend some time talking about um, the the recent events of the coronavirus and kind of tell you where we are um, with Clinton City Schools. Um, we are watching um, the spread of this very, very closely. Uh, Jamie, as you know, leads um, in conjunction with Laura Roberts, leads our coordinated school health, and she has been in conversation with Gail Baird on a regular basis regarding the effects of Anderson County. Um, I know that earlier today it was announced that there has been the first confirmed case in Knox County, who um, Tim just shared with me, they're saying has um, already isolated himself and has or his, himself or herself and has not come in contact with um, lots of people. But um, we did confirm today there is not a confirmed case at this point in Anderson County. Um, as long as there is not a confirmed case in Anderson County, our plan is to continue going to school. Uh, we have been questioned. Um, uh, Anderson County did end up doing a procedure where they've canceled all of their field trips between now and spring break. Um, but his situation was a little bit different. He had groups going to Nashville and Memphis and to large urban cities. Um, I've been asked if we're going to shut down uh, the Blaze Well-Rounded activities in the afternoon or any of our after school. And at this point, I am not because those, those groups of people have between 30, 35 people, which is very similar to what you would be exposed to in the cafeteria in the classroom. So at this point, we are just continuing to, we're, we're researching CDC, we're in contact with the Anderson County Health Department. We are receiving from directors, we are receiving communication from the Tennessee Department of Education and Tennessee Department of Health, also kind of advising us on uh, what we need to do from a school aspect. There are no recommendations at this point that we need to be closing school. Now that could change in an hour that could change you know tomorrow that could not change so we're just we really cannot predict we do know that it is going to hit Anderson County and it will affect Clinton City at some point in some way what we don't know is when and how long and what what the effect is going to be so we are just continuing to rely heavily on the experts to help us make the best decisions for Clinton City Schools um, I have been in contact with um, Scott and he has been in contact with Airmark if we ever were to encounter a situation where we needed to close for an extended amount of time for several weeks. Um, Airmark is working with us and we are also trying to get some guidance from the State Department of Nutrition on how we could continue to offer our federally, um, federally uh, federal lunches to any student who needed to come and get that during the school day. It would certainly be a take-home thing. We wouldn't be congregating them in the in the cafeteria but we're trying to get some plans in place of what that might look like where we could still support our kids with at least one hot meal per day if we did need to close for an extended amount of time. As for our 13 stockpile days that we get, we of course use three of them for professional development. That leaves 10 for inclement weather. We have four of those days left. And so certainly if we do need to close, um, we will um, use up those four. And the State Department has been very, very clear that they will work with districts once they have run out of their stockpile days. If there are further needs that arise, they are willing to work with us on that. So that is where we, where we stand um, at this point. So before I move on any any questions about our plan in Clinton City and so we'll just continue to we, we continue to stay updated um, so uh, you know about our Clinton Blaze Special Olympic uh, breakfast it's going to be held from 8 to 10 we would love for you to come out and join us as the students have worked hard practicing their skills um, I wanted to inform you all about something new that we have started this year with regards to our attendance policy and attendance procedure. Um, as you know, chronic absenteeism is now part of our state accountability model. And uh, while it counts as 10% of a school's um, overall what will be letter grades this year, it's
it's a pretty important part when we look at school accountability and the fact of whether, um, I guess, our district designation. And when we looked at us being an exemplary district this year, our low chronic absenteeism rates really, really helped us reach the threshold of being an exemplary district. So attendance does matter. Um, and so we have implemented an additional support step called Campus Court this year. And we have contracted with Chris McCarty, our school attorney, and once a child has reached a certain threshold with unexcused absences, and Jamie has exhausted all of her um, resources and support, then they are, um, they are requested or actually um, required to attend campus court. And at this, Chris just walks the parents through, you know, these are the supports we've offered, this is where your child stands, this is kind of the last step before we file a parent neglect, educational neglect petition. Um, and we've seen probably, we've served over 20 kids so far. Is that, is that an accurate number, Jamie, between all the kids that have, because some families have had multiple kids. But uh, we've held this campus court twice now. Um, representing about 20 kids in our system and it has really really been a good thing and one of the most positive things that we have done you know we don't want our parents to see that as punitive in nature but we also want them to be very very well well aware of the consequences for not meeting the compulsory attendance law and so a lot of good has come out of that we've seen several people change the trajectory with their attendance but with that said we do have a few um, I want to prepare you that we do have a few that in the next couple of weeks we will probably be moving towards uh, filing um, educational neglect that is not something we have typically done in Clinton City Schools but I think we have to send a clear message that school is important and your children need to be in school if we're going to be held accountable for the scores and if that's a part of our accountability then I need to we need to be holding parents accountable for bringing their kids to school so more to come on that um, we will be um, having hosting federal monitors in our building uh, next Tuesday and Wednesday the 17th and 18th this is part of a um, this is just we are in a rotation cycle they actually have not been to monitor us in probably seven or eight years but this is a programming and instructional monitoring so they'll be monitoring title one title two II, title four and um, all of Suzanne's IDEA, both her special ed programming and her special ed pre-K. So they'll be with us for two days, but the preparation for this has been immense. They do it, you have to submit everything online and then they come in for a visit. So I just wanna publicly commend Lori Collins and her work that she has done to prepare the system and then they'll be attending, um, let's see, Clinton and North, correct, Lori? Clinton Elementary and North Clinton will be the two site visits that they do. She has worked endless hours among and above and beyond everything else that has been on her plate. And she has just done a remarkable job getting ready for this monitoring. So um, as we said, they're, they're going to come. We're going to learn if we're doing something wrong, we'll fix it. But I think they'll be pleased with what they see. Then of course our Grand Family's Night on March the 19th. That's always a big success. And I think we have over 20 vendors that will be coming this year to support grandparents who are raising grandchildren. Um, then we got a pleasant surprise this week that I wanted to let you know about. Um, Kristen Walsh-Logger, she works um, as a liaison with CNS, where the Y-12 um, is in Oak Ridge. And uh, as you know, we offer a week-long summer biz town camp to our students free of charge. And that has been a cost that we've always incurred in Clinton City Schools using instructional funds to pay for that. And she um, called and asked, um, I think Callie Archer actually sent her our way, so we owe Callie a great big thank you. But anyway, she actually called and has agreed to sponsor our Clinton City Schools camp for this year. So she, uh, CNS is going to pick up the $1,500 tab for that this year. Um, also, E.T. is hard at work just trying to see how many well-rounded things that he can expose our children to in the city of Clinton. So we are going to be offering a tennis clinic in March and April, and uh, the tennis registration forms are flowing in. My box was full, uh, full of them this morning. Um, Ernie Brooks, who actually, I'm not sure if you all know who he is or not, but he um, actually attended Clinton High School um, and uh, played tennis and I believe maybe track. But anyway, his son is, uh, he works at SL and is a good community partner to us. And Stephen Brooks, he serves on um, several of our um, community committees and is a big support to us. That's his father and he's gonna lead that and he's gotten 
lots of tennis. I mean, the people who are coming to lead this for us are just amazing with a, a plethora of tennis experience. They've gotten tennis clubs to donate rackets and, and uh, tennis balls to where if a student doesn't have a racket, that doesn't keep them from participating. So we look forward to that happening at Lakefront Park. Um, our next collaborative day is going to be on March the 20th. Of course, that will focus on testing. Um, we are moving towards an iPad, iPad platform for our kindergarten teachers next year to where we would be one-to-one -one with iPads in all of our kindergarten classrooms. They're going to get their first set of five iPads on this day so they can begin to implement those in small groups and just kind of play around with some of the apps and kind of see how we want to integrate that once we become one-to-one. -one. So that will happen on that day. And then special area teachers will be doing collaborative planning as we're trying to plan for the art fair and um, some of our other wonderful events in the spring. Um, and then if you take a look down, we, uh, we can't do anything in Clinton City without a logo or some sort of promotion. You know, that's the way we function. Um, we are uh, changing a little bit of our sixth grade one-to-one uh, -one technology for learning program. And so they will be receiving a new Chromebook at the beginning of the year. And then we are going to pilot a program next year and allow students the ability to take home that Chromebook um, with them. And so uh, we came up with a nice program logo of Clinton City Schools Chrome Home. And I need for y'all to love that logo a little bit, if, if hopefully you get it. Do we get it? <laughs> the first version, Todd Temple did that for us, and the first version that came, I have to say, had E.T.'s face in the middle of it. And Wait, of course, yeah. E.T.? E.T. E.T. Stamey's oh, face okay. was in the middle of that face, and <laughs> so we got a big kick out of that, and uh, so uh, I've got set safe for something special. <laughs> I'm going to pull that out on a special day. But anyway, I just, we thought that was a nice play on... Um, and who was it? I, I, was it uh, someone didn't like it because they didn't think that kids would know who E.T. was. And we we're like, all kids know who E.T. They, 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 they know E.T. So anyway, yeah. so that's our fun little play. I thought you might enjoy that. You'll see that on social media and all of the communication that goes home. Uh, with that said, we're currently um, accepting registration forms for next year. Um, so we're um, eager to see what preliminary numbers look like. Um, our transfer period this year, as you know, we, we, we moved it to an exact period, will be from April 14th to July 15th, and then after July 15th, if you are an out-of-city resident, you will be put on a waiting list until we see the whites of eyeballs and make sure that we've taken care of all city kids. Um, mark your calendars for April the 7th. That will be our CCS Family Art Night. You have a flyer there. Um, I think the theme this year is going to be 20th Century Art, so we look forward to that. And then I have two more quick things that did not make the list. Um, as we talked about empty bowls, that was one of, it's always one of the highlights of what we do in Clinton City Schools. It's just become such an integral part of what we do. Um, this year we significantly increased our revenue um, from this event by over $2,000. So we took in that night $6,500. And so uh, once we pay for expenses of the stone soup, uh, the remainder of that will be going to um, Second Harvest Food Bank. And so that is just a huge testament um, to what our kids do. And just to give you an update, um, I'm telling you this enough in advance before my evaluation happens so you might forget. You know, the first year with the bowl, we started off as $45. Remember, David Queener, you bought my bowl. It was a pity buy, yeah. but you bought my bowl. So I would think that I would get better each year, but the second year it sold for $35. And I thought it was really a better bowl, but it sold for $35. So this year, I hate to say, but I'm still on a decline, and sweet Joey Smith took pity upon me, and I got $25 for my bowl. So I'm like on a downward spiral with, with my bowls. So I'm going to seek the help of some assistance next year from, from someone. I think I've met, I've actually met a fifth grade boy that is, he said that he would be happy to help me with my bowl next year. So I'm going to take him up on that offer and see if I can't recoup some of my funds. But thank you, Joey, for I having, really liked it. thank you for having pity upon my, upon my bowl. Now, I guess another school board will have, remember, will have to have pity on me next year. Uh, and then one oh, yeah. final update, um, when we talked about the five-year strategic plan and we were talking about that elementary alternative classroom and I think you all decided to move on that, move on that sooner than later. We have decided with the expansion that we are going to move on that for next year based on some current needs that we have. 
Um, I wanted to look internally uh, to see if any staff members that are current currently employed with Clinton City Schools would be interested in that. And you know, sometimes when you just ask the question, it is just like everything falls straight from heaven right in your lap. So I'm pleased to announce that Jill Turbyville has expressed interest in this position and actually accepted the position for our, uh, it's going to be called the best class for behavior, emotional, social, and trauma. And so it will be our best class. And she expressed interest with a few question marks. And uh, Suzanne and I met with her. And before we left, we were all three jumping up and down. And she is just excited for this new opportunity. So she is going to undergo some uh, trauma-informed discipline practices training, some restorative practices training. And she will collaborate closely with regular education teachers, as this is a regular ed placement. It is not a special ed classroom. And uh, so we will probably be utilizing one of our new classrooms, um, depending on how, when the building gets done and what kind of moves Jen is able to make if fourth grade goes there, if we have to wait, or what happens. But it will be housed at Clinton Elementary, because um, we have a CDC at North, a CDC at South, and then the best class will be at Clinton Elementary School. So I was tickled that we were able to find somebody internally. And for those of you who have worked with Jill, you know, as soon as she says she was interested, we all looked and said, perfect, because she just has patience. She deals very, very well with all uh, children of all kinds of, uh, all kinds of needs, but has a true compassion. And I think she's just going to be the perfect person for this job. So we are moving on that class. We envision that it will have a TA eventually. We're not going to start off with a TA just until we kind of see what the needs are and see how the building plays, the building plays out. But we, we will have that up and running by next year. So any questions for me? I love it. <laughs> I, mean, I know having taught and having been a principal, it can just severely affect you when you try and you try and you try. So I'm tickled. Yeah. Real tickled. Well, it's going to be good for the teachers. Mm -hmm. It's going to be good for the students. And we're just providing, you know, we learned that we not all our students learn the same way. So if we can provide an alternative therapeutic classroom for some of our children to be successful, then that's what we need to do. So I appreciate your all support and allowing that to happen so quickly. That concludes my report. All right. Any further questions or comments for Ms. Kelly? Hearing none, I'll declare this meeting adjourned.